Now, verse 5 makes a turning point in the story. We now see the tower through God's eyes. Now first through the people's eyes, now through God's eyes. Look at verse number 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth. That's not what they wanted. That's exactly what they were trying to avoid. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So two times we see that what they feared actually happened. Why? Because that's what God wanted to begin with. So if this tower was so grand and so magnificent, really it was so tiny and puny that God couldn't even see it from his heaven. So he had to come down and take a look at it. Now that's irony, of course. God doesn't come down. God's everywhere present, so he doesn't need to come down anywhere. We understand that. It's just a way for us to understand what's going on here. So coming down is the prelude for judgment in the Bible. Whenever we see that God comes down, it's usually to come down to act, and it's probably because man is misbehaving. So we know he can't literally come down because he's everywhere present, but it's an anthropomorphic statement so we can understand from our point of view, God came down. Again, it's so tiny he couldn't see it from heaven. And the let us of divine activity thwarts the let us of human rebellion. Let us go down. Let us do this. Let us confuse the language. Now, it's a divine majesty. Now, it could be some have said that he's speaking to the divine council uh, or he's speaking to each, each other in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, the God, one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the, God the Holy Spirit. So this idea of let us come down is probably a divine plural. A divine plural. But what a brilliant way of expressing the puniness of man's greatest achievement when set alongside God's omnipotence. Their plan was a tiny tower conceived by a puny plan and attempted by pint-sized people in comparison to a great God. And then it says, now nothing will be impossible for them. Just exactly like it was before the flood. It had gotten so bad that nothing was impossible. Whatever their hearts wanted to do before the flood, that's exactly what they're doing. So so what does it mean when, when, when God says, nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them? That sounds like a good thing. Oh, they could, they could solve cancer. They could figure out how to solve cancer. Nothing will be impossible for the human race if if, if we leave them just like this. That's not what he's saying. This likely refers not to the heights of accomplishment that mankind could achieve, but to the depths of sin to which mankind is capable of falling. If their sin goes unchecked, there is no telling how much worse it will get. No rebellion is too great for them. Nothing will be sacred in their crooked hearts. They have become just like the people prior to the flood. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They're back to basically the same place prior to the flood. It's only been 150 years. They're in the exact same place. Well, God promised he would not destroy the earth again with water. He's not going to do that. So he's got a different plan for these people that are acting the same way as those before the flood. So with the building of the tower, it becomes possible that the pride and confidence of mankind will advance rapidly towards the destruction of freedom, of the personal life, and of the followers of God in his kingdom. So God says, no, stop, stop. I mean, look around us today. You only have to read the newspaper, listen to the, to the news that's on television or the radio Look at the depths of sin mankind is capable of falling into. The evidence is all around us. Could you imagine if we all spoke the same language and we all got together to do everything that our heart desired? I think we need to thank 
God for his restraining grace right here because the world could have been a much eviler place than it was than it was then. God stops it. So in chapter 10, that's obviously chapter prior to chapter 11, God describes the nations. He lists the people and he talks about their nations, okay, that are there. This is them out. But in chapter 11, he tells us how the nations came into existence. It's a typical pattern that the biblical writers, especially in the Old Testament, like to do. The Hebrew writers, they would, they would record an event and they would go back and they would give you a more detailed narration of the event they just recorded. So chapter 10 records all of the nations, who was there, who the people are, and all the nations. But chapter 11 then goes back and gives us more detail how the nations came about. Genesis chapter 1, where God creates man. Genesis chapter 2 is a more detailed account of Genesis chapter 1. Again, the statement in 1, a retelling of the statement or a backstory in chapter 2. That's what's happening here. Because if you read 10, you'll go, wait a second, the nations are already here. But then in chapter 11, there's still one people. So how does that happen? It's because the story's been told to us. Now it's retold again and given more detail. It's a backstory. So the whole story now moves to explain the word Babel. What is this word Babel? and to describe it as being under divine judgment now, this word Babel. So the name given to the project Babel describes actually their failure, not their success. They failed to make a name for themselves. That's what they wanted, but it didn't. God dispersed them. There's no name for themselves now. The city and the tower are not, no longer being built. We see the perfect example of the futility of man setting himself against his creator. I mean, think about it. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And when it was all said and done, they couldn't even pronounce each other's names. This tower was, was a monument to the judgment of God because his expressed will asked them, told them, disperse upon the face of the earth. Don't congregate in one place. Don't make a name for yourself. Glorify me in your existence. Gordon Winham commented, the Tower of Babel was intended to be a monument to human effort. Instead, it became a reminder of divine judgment on human pride and folly. God did not give them what they wanted, and that's actually good. That's actually good. Sometimes we pray for things that we think we need, and God says no, because we don't really need that, and it would actually be harmful for us if we got it. Thank God for his restraining grace. So in creating the nations, when God made the nations, he divided them out and they had their own language for the nations. So in creating the nations, God's express will at this time in history is opposed to a one world government. It is not according to God's express will at this time in history that the world of mankind has a one world government. But really, when you think about it, isn't that the push that we're hearing constantly nowadays? And how convenient it would be if there was a one world government with a one world ruler. We could get a whole lot of stuff done as mankind when we all have one ruler running us. We hear it. We hear it from politicians. We hear it from the UN. We hear it from the World Economic Forum. This whole push to a one world government. But see, God established the nations and he defined their boundaries. Here are three verses that speak about that. Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Acts. Deuteronomy says, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. He said, I want this nation there, I want this nation there, I want this nation there, and I want this. He defined the borders of those nations. Psalm 74, you have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter, Acts 17. And he made from one nation, uh, from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. God has established the nations. That's what he wants at this time in history. He doesn't want a one world government. He dispersed the people at this point because it is not right. They had tried to establish a one world government. And it's still a desire today. Again, it sure would be convenient. One ruler telling everyone what to do would be a whole lot more convenient. So, why do I resist 
a one world government? That's my first question. Why do I, why, why do I resist a one world government? Well, simple answer. It is contrary to the express will of God at this time in history. Anything contrary to the express will of God, I am against, I oppose, I resist. I stand with God in his truth. So that's the first question. Why would I resist a one world government? Okay, because it's against the express will of God. Now, the second question is very similar to that, but it's a little bit different. Why would I resist a one world government when the Bible clearly teaches under the Antichrist there will be a one world government? Aren't I fighting against the Bible at that point? That's my second question. Aren't I fighting against the Bible at that point? Isn't it a futile battle because I know eventually under the Antichrist there's going to be a one world government? Why do I resist it? Why do I fight against it at this point? If I know it's going to happen, why don't I just sit back and say, well, that's what's going to happen? <laughs> that makes it super easy to live, doesn't it? We know certain things are going to happen. So, wouldn't it be easier to just sit around and say, well, God's going to do it anyway. Why should I stand for truth when everyone else is opposed to that truth? Why should I put myself out there? Why should I even make myself known to be opposed to this when everyone else is against it? It'd just be easier to sit back and let it happen. How can I allow anything that is contrary to the express will of God? Even when I know the Antichrist is going to establish, and by the way, the kingdom the Antichrist established is also opposed to God's express will because he is evil. There is only one, one world government that will submit to the rule of God and God's expressed order, and that is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only one world government that is according to the expressed will of God. His will be a perfect government when he comes. In fact, the one we like to read at Christmas time out of Isaiah talks about him, this child that is born, but it talks about his government. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of course, this is pointing to Jesus Christ. Of the increase of his government, and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, for he is king to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do it. That will be the perfect one world government. And Until then, it is God's expressed will that we have nation states, not a one world government. And when the Antichrist sets it up, it is also going to be opposed to the will of God. So I say, resist, well, better yet, first of all, stand with God and then resist all things that are opposed to his expressed will for our lives. Even resist self. Me. When I see in me those tendencies that are contrary to the expressed will of God, I am going to resist self. And I'm going to say, God, by your power of your spirit, give me the strength to stand, to be strengthened in the inner man that we talked about last time, to stand for truth in this world. I'm even going to resist self when he is opposed, me when I'm opposed to God's expressed will. That's how deep I'm willing to go with this. Chapter 11 obviously bleeds into chapter 12. And we have a person called Abraham in chapter 12. And the calling of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 should always be read in light of Genesis chapters 10 and 11. In other words, we, where do the nations come from? And God is going to establish a brand new nation with, with Abraham. And through him, all the nations of the earth. Notice the word nation often. We can go back and read Genesis chapter uh, 12 verses 1 through 3. The word nation is used often. He will be a blessing to all the nations. Of course, that's through Christ. So the significance of the Babel story for Israel would speak to the critical role Abraham played in the world of nations. That's why it's here in 11 and Abraham following in chapter 12 and following. So chapter 11 ends with the families of the earth hopelessly scattered throughout the known world. And out of the scattered nations, God formed one nation, which would become his channel of blessing for all the other nations of the world. So any culture any people, any person, such as Babel, that defies the express will of God 
would meet with the same end as this tower. Kurt Strassner wrote, let us admit that modern men and women are not above the ancient sin of Babel, thinking ourselves wiser than God. Surely God isn't saying what it looks as if he's saying, we think to ourselves. Surely God will understand if I fudge on this commandment. Surely given the modern situation, we can't be expected to take all these commands literally. This is the sin of Babel and of many modern churchgoers as well. It's a temptation we must avoid. Blessings come by obedience to the expressed will of God. Judgment is a result of disobedience, whether in a person or in a nation. 